the moment of truth in the hospitality industry. Ted Middleton, Senior Vice President, Development, Latino America and the Caribbean at Hilton. Francis Gonzalez, Vice President Operations, Latin America at Radisson Hotel Group. And David Tarr, Senior Vice President, Development, Americas at Hyatt, in an open conversation with Stephanie Rica, Editorial Director, Hotel News Now. Hi, everybody. Evelina is going to count us in live, I believe, in just a second here. I guess we are live. Okay. <laughs> Let's get started, everybody. And I'm sure that uh, you will find a way to let me know if we're doing anything wrong via the chat, but it looks like we are good to go. Hello again. It's your old friend Stephanie from Hotel News Now. You all know me by now. And I'd like to get the panel started right away because we just have a little bit of time this morning. I'm going to ask each speaker to introduce him or herself briefly since we only have a quick amount of time. And while you do that, give us a quick status update of your company's portfolio in Latin America, Caribbean with that you know, backdrop of has everything opened? Where does it stand right now? Francis, we'll start with you. Hello, everybody. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, this is Frances Gonzalez. I am Vice President of Operations for Radisson Hotel Group uh, in charge of the Latin America region. Um, at the peak of the situation, we had a total of 59% 59, 59 of our inventory closed. Um, I'm happy to say that the majority of the properties have reopened. And at the end of October, we should be back only with six properties closed. Wonderful. David Tarr, give us the update from Hyatt and a quick introduction of yourself. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Tarr. I'm Senior Vice President of Development for the Americas Region for Hyatt Hotels. Um, we have about 30% of our portfolio in the region uh, still closed. Um, eight full service hotels, five of about a dozen select service hotels remain closed. Um, we'll have a few more opening uh, this month. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll be uh, getting back to full strength at some point soon. Great, I think that's definitely the trajectory that we see, even though there are still some hanging on, we're, we're moving forward. So Ted, how about a quick introduction of yourself and a snapshot of Hilton in the region? Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I, I'm a Senior Vice President of Development for the uh, Cavill region. Uh, we we have uh, 164 hotels in the region. Of those 164 hotels, 138 are open and 26 are temporarily suspended. And the the, the trend is, it seems like every week, uh, one or two additional properties open. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that um, all 164 hotels will eventually be open. Again, it's that that positive trajectory that uh, that only <laughs> happens with time, as we've learned through this pandemic. Now, of course, you all represent brands very active in the region. I'd like to kick off the conversation today by talking about the role of the brand during a time of crisis like we're in now. And I'd like you each to answer this one. We'll start with you again, Francis. What would you say your top priorities are? as a brand at this point in the pandemic? Well, Stephanie, we've always been a owner-centric franchise company. We understand that communication and being engaged with our owners is key to our success. Um, in these times, we thought we saw that even being even more important. And we have been conducting trainings, webinars, uh, emails on a weekly basis. And, and I think that the value of the brands came on this situation when we were able to immediately move and started getting supplies that they much needed, like all the personal equipment and everything that was required to handle this, this situation and this crisis. Um, I think that at a brand level with our resources and our partners, we were able to secure the much needed material that they needed on a timely fashion and also provide guidance because as an independent hotel as a single owner maybe they don't know exactly what is out there and what options they have um, we immediately moved to to make sure that our owners have the tools and information that they needed uh, another thing is that like every other company we had our fair share of furloughs and people that we had to lay off 
for a, for a temporary time, but I am happy to say that Radisson Hotel Group made a very uh, informed decision to do not uh, cut the operation support, to not cut the field support, to make sure that when our owners had a question or needed assistance, we were there for them. So it sounded like quickness, being able to really be there right away was a top priority. Ted, tell us what, you know, how, how Hilton's priorities have been as a brand when it comes to dealing with the pandemic, dealing with owners in the region. Well, we, we've uh, also done everything we can uh, to advocate, uh, advocate for our owners' interests. We've also uh, done things like we've uh, relaxed certain brand standards that uh, help uh, defray uh, costs. Uh, we, we've cut their operating costs uh, through uh, reduced fees that they pay to us in order to enhance their bottom line. And we've invested in programs that we know will help deliver revenue and drive market share. So we're, we're really focused on trying to help our owners uh, navigate these turb turbulent times. Mm -hmm. David, how has Hyatt's response been in terms of priorities immediately out of the gate and then getting to where we are now, where we're, you know, six, seven months in? Yeah, I, th I think this is a, re a really common theme between Francis's company, Ted's, and, and ours. Um, Hyatt is a purpose-driven company. Um, we're, we're always guided by our purpose, which is to care for people so they can be their best. And we apply that to our interactions with our guests, our hotel owners, our communities, and our associates. So every decision we have made uh, during this health crisis from the very beginning has been based on having very robust and transparent conversations with, with each of these constituents, as we all know, um, in an ideal world, we're all pulling on the rope together, but, but everyone has different objectives during a time like this, and we've tried to balance those objectives uh, as best as we could, um, but all the while being very transparent and clear in our communication. So everything we've done from the beginning has been based on that feedback, everything from uh, working with the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council to put new hygiene protocols in our hotels, to, as Ted said, taking a hard look at our chain services structure, which I will say we didn't even, we didn't approach from a temporary point of view. We have actually retooled our chain services fee structure to more closely align it with, uh, with revenues uh, based on feedback we've received from our hotels. Um, and then with respect to our guests, of course, more flexibility with respect to cancellations, um, deferment of expiration of World of Hyatt points. We've really tried to take on board feedback from each constituent base and make sure that uh, what we're doing is keeping them front and center in what we're doing. So it sounds like the themes that I'm hearing here are rapid response, you know, very open lines of communication and finding ways to relieve some burden onto owners. Before we move on, I want to ask, and, um, just because this is something that we often hear about is obviously brand companies just like hotels are going through issues of, you know, having to furlough or downsize a little bit. What would you all say the best advice for owners or franchisees in the region is if they're trying to get in touch with their brand partner and maybe are having some difficulty? Is there one channel that's better than others? Is there any particular piece of advice that you have? Um, and I'll let anybody jump in on that one. Well, I can start by saying that in that particular case, that was one of our top priorities. And that's, like I mentioned before, we didn't cut on any of the direct support to the hotels. Uh, we might have cut in some other areas that are more support to us like maybe accounting, finance, and, and some of the other areas. But in the case of support for the hotels, we understood that we had to be there for them whenever they needed us. And uh, piggybacking a little bit on what we were talking before, we also implemented uh, safety protocols and we partnered with, with a well-renowned company called SGS to certify all of our protocols. Um, we made the decision to cover the cost for all of those for all of our hotels because we knew that that was what was important for everybody at the moment. So again, 
we were always there for them, whether it was via email, phone call, WhatsApp, even through Facebook, but to make sure that we could connect with them any way that they needed to. Great. So it's more than just a call. There's lots of avenues to find yeah. that relationship with your brand. David, Ted, anything to add on there on that point? Well, I, I'd say, you know, sort of like what Francis said, uh, during times like this, it's of paramount importance to stay in constant contact with our owners, operators and investors and to provide them the support they need to navigate this crisis. Um, your original question, uh, I think, was what, what do we say to owners that uh, are calling us and are not getting a response? Well, let us know who the person isn't that isn't responding and that they're going to be in trouble uh, because that, that's just not part of our corporate culture. Right, right. David, anything to add? Uh, only that we were pr very proactive. Um, I, I don't believe any of our owners were wondering who to contact because we had teams put in place at the beginning to have outreach. Uh, we, we don't have an owner that wasn't contacted very early in the process and had an avenue uh, to, to have ears on whatever issues they were facing. Great. Let's move on and talk about hotel development in the region. You know, like we've heard throughout the course of the conference this year, business and life goes on. You all have pipelines in Latin America and the Caribbean. You've all signed deals in the region in the last few months as well. Can you talk about any particular hotel or resort projects that were in the ground, you know, in active construction when this hit, yet not open? And what's happened there? You know, how, what has that pause looked like if there has been a pause? And that's open to any of you. There's been different reasons. Uh, we have uh, about a dozen projects underway in the region. Um, the, the pause has been caused by anything from um, worker safety, construction worker safety, and perhaps local or federal mandate in certain countries. Um, we've had material shortages coming out of China and elsewhere that have um, maybe not halted projects, but caused them to slow down. I think the biggest um, issue we've been facing, and this is not in relation to construction projects, but is the um, the elimination effectively of any financing for new hotels, um, which we're facing not just in the Caribbean and Latin America, but in the U.S. as well. Um, if projects didn't already have a financing commitment, uh, they are effectively on hold um, until we get through this period. 